online. Old home week this past week. I took my girls last night to the fair and uh, bank account is a little lighter. <laughs> Boy, it's not cheap to go to the fair these days, but we had a great time. Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your servants, give you humble and wholehearted thanks for your goodness, your loving kindness to us and to all people. And we bless you for your creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your inestimable love and the redemption of the lost through our Lord Jesus Christ, and by means of grace, and for the hope of glory of your name. Meet us here this morning. Father, we invite you. Be with us. Join us. Protect this space. Thank you that we have this space to gather freely and worship you. And we love you as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand as we join and worship together this morning. I'm reading from Psalm 134. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who minister by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and praise the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who is the maker of heaven and earth. We're going to sing To God Be the Glory this morning. To God be the glory, great things he hath done, so loved he the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher. Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. Amen. Sin, 
the blood applied. Glory to his name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. the blood applied. Glory to his name. O precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. like to have a seat, go ahead. Um, one of the advantages of picking music is you get to pick some of your favorites. And uh, this is one of my favorite old hymns. I'm reading from Lamentations 3, verse 22 to 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We're going to sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassion. They fail not as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I
Thy own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand besides. Great is thy faithfulness. The scripture reading for this morning will be taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I I am the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the end. Those are powerful words. Sorry, I just need a moment. (laughs) To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a precious jewel like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Dear Lord, let's pray together. This is the book of Revelation. (laughs) It's, It's just so full of so many incredible words and pictures. 
and visuals of what we have to look forward to. And Lord, we are so amazed that you gave John that book for us to read and to think about, Lord, and to dwell on in terms of how wonderful we have this future to look forward to. And Lord, we thank you that you are also here with us in the present day, that because of Jesus and his saving work on the cross for us, Lord, that each one of us have our sins forgiven and the amazing free gift of salvation that you have given to us, Lord, in your great love and power and mercy. And Lord, we just ask that you would be with each person, Lord, who is here today and also online, Lord, just help us, Lord, that our hearts and minds would be open to hearing your word today. And we pray for Trip, Lord, talking about the supernatural is a wonderful, a wonderful thing to be assigned to us. And we know, Lord, that the supernatural includes also the evil one and his plans of deception for each one of us, but we also know that your spirit of power and love and a sound mind lives in us, and that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world, and we thank you and praise you for the victory that we have through Christ. And we just pray, Lord, that you would use Trip today to bring forth this message to us, your truth, Lord, which really is the only truth. Help us, Lord, to hear and listen and understand, Lord, what you want us to hear. And be with Trip, Lord, and fill his heart and mind and words and actions, Lord, with the power of your Holy Spirit that you might use him this day to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do you believe the Bible? All of it? Part of it? Most of it? Some of it? Because, amen. <laughs> Thank you. We're talking today about some pretty strange things. I mean, just think about the faith we believe. A creator outside of time and space. The creation of everything from nothing. A beautiful heavenly garden where earth and heaven intersect. Miracles, signs and wonders. The God of everything becoming human. Birthed into our reality through a virgin teenage girl. Jesus' resurrection. His heavenly ascension. Do you believe those things? Each of those things. What about angels, heaven, hell, the devil, demons? Do you believe that they're real? I mean, this is what we're talking about today. The supernatural is, is woven all throughout Scripture, Old and New Testaments. In fact, Scripture tells us to believe that the supernatural is actually more real than the natural. The author of Hebrews says, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. So let me ask again, because this is so important, friends, we must believe that the supernatural is real. Why is this so important? Because Scripture says that the evidence for the supernatural is our faith. My faith and your faith, your faith. How do people know that God is real? That Jesus really died on the cross and rose again? That the Holy Spirit moves and works boldly through us in this darkened world? That angels are now even battling satanic forces around us? 
and that time seems to be moving more quickly toward Christ's imminent return. Well, our faith is or should be the evidence of all that. I love what J.C. Ryle says about why the supernatural things in Scripture are so vital to our faith. He was an Anglican bishop in the 1800s. And, and he said this, he says, the man who was about to sail for Australia or New Zealand as a settler is naturally anxious to know something about his future home, its climate, its employments, its inhabitants, its ways, its customs. All these are subjects of deep interest to him because you're leaving the land of your nativity. You're leaving what's familiar and what you've grown accustomed to. And you are now going to spend the rest of your life in a new hemisphere, a new place, a new land, a foreign world. It would be strange indeed if you did not desire some information about your new abode then. Now surely if we hope to dwell forever in that better place, that better country, or even a heavenly one, ought we to seek all the knowledge we can about it. Before we go to our eternal home, we should try to be acquainted with it. That's, that's what he says. So everything about the Christian life involves the supernatural. Us created beings with God's eternal image in us, praying to, worshiping, and engaging in relationship with this eternal God. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44, they, human beings, who are redeemed in Jesus Christ are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. And you see what Paul is saying. He's saying, yes, death is a natural process of this life, but our eternal life, Scripture assures us, is just as real, if not more so. Our eternal life is supernatural. What's the logic here then? Well, there's a way of living and operating in this world, I think we'd all agree. We have jobs, we, we have families, friends, we earn a wage to afford housing, or try to. <laughs> Shelter, food, clothing. We also know that there are things we can do and, and pre prepare for in this world to try and ensure our safety, our protection, survival of ourselves and our loved ones. There are things to enjoy and celebrate in this life and reality, but the problem with this life, this world, is that it's fallen and therefore unpredictable. Bad things happen to everyone, good people, not so good people. But I think we would all agree, I believe, that there are healthy ways not just to get through this life, but to protect ourselves and the ones we love as best we can, and to actually find some enjoyment healthily as best we can. So as Ryle just told us, and Apostle Paul just explained, if our eternal life beyond this life is just as real as this one, shouldn't we learn more about it then? Shouldn't we learn and, and prepare for that reality? In, in fact, Scripture tells us that heaven and earth are intersecting even now. So shouldn't we know more about the supernatural with an expectation that there is, in fact, a way to operate healthily there and here? So back to Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the proof, the evidence of the supernatural and what we believe. So I guess my question needs to be, is your faith, your faith, my faith, is it big enough and strong enough to account for the supernatural? If faith is the first step into supernatural reality, then by faith, through faith, we need to learn how to safely navigate and embrace this reality. And therefore, since the supernatural is only known by faith, we must learn to live by faith or, or learn to grow into living by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, for we live by believing and not by seeing. Here's why this is so important. 
Paul actually has a warning for us in Ephesians 6, 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, he says, flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and, and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. The truth is, friends, the reality is, we are in a battle between good and evil that is not flesh and blood, but in forces that are unseen and supernatural all around us. It, it all started way back in the garden when humanity gave the devil a foothold into God's good creation. And now the world, humanity, the angels have been in this supernatural battle ever since. We can't gloss over this. This is too important to flip past or ignore. A professor and his wife were visiting a church on vacation, and, and the pastor there was preaching a sermon, a sermon series on 1 Peter, and that Sunday was to be on chapter 3, verses 18 to 22, which says this, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the Spirit. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his ark. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, Paul continues, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It's effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honor next to God and all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. So this professor was looking forward to hearing this pastor's take on these powerful verses. To his amazement, astonishment, and, and disappointment, the first thing the pastor said when he got to the lectern was, we're going to skip these next few verses because these are just too weird. Look, I'm not here to judge or belittle, but I can confidently say that I don't think that's the proper attitude. You know, yes, reading some of these verses about what's going on supernaturally can be weird and discomforting, but all the more reason to engage with them, yes? All the more reason to wrestle with the supernatural in order to gain some understanding and appreciation. Because Scripture over and over affirms the reality of the heavenly realm. So we must learn as God's earthly, heavenly agents to live and operate by faith. Amen? So one of the clear ways we can actually believe and know that the supernatural is real is that Jesus in his ministry on earth spoke and taught about the supernatural quite often. And when he spoke of the heavenly realm, it wasn't a place somewhere out there. No, it was real and happening even now. When he taught the disciples to pray, he declared, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's a powerful statement. Don't miss this. Jesus is telling the disciples to pray that God's will would be done on earth here and now as it already has been happening and is already happening in heaven. This one little verse in this powerful prayer tells us the reality of God's rule and will being accomplished and, and having been accomplished by Him in His courts as the King of the universe and that this King has a kingdom in heaven with agents whom He counsels and rules through in the reality of heaven. So let's, let's start with heaven. Jesus often spoke of heaven as a very real place, as natural as our place. Jesus told his disciples about a heaven that was prepared for by him. For example, listen to what Jesus says in John 14, verses 1 through 2. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled, Jesus continued. Trust God. Trust me too. There's plenty of room to live in my Father's house. If that wasn't the case, I'd have told you, wouldn't I? I'm going to get a place ready for you. 
You see what Jesus is saying. He, he's saying, yes, it might be hard or even uncomfortable to try and imagine this heavenly realm, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's very real. I've been there. And my father has a big, beautiful home there. And there's plenty of room for all of you. In fact, I'm going there myself to prepare each of your rooms. That's comforting, isn't it? The point is, if Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, which He most definitely is, amen, then we can trust that He paved the very way to heaven and that in full truth, life there is more real and natural than we could ever possibly imagine. Amen? What can we expect in that reality of heaven? Well, listen to Revelation 22. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. Remember when we talked about the beginning and when humanity sinned, everything because of that sin was cursed on earth. Well, there's no more curse upon anything. Hallelujah. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there. His servants will worship Him. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. Heaven, biblically speaking, is not somewhere out there. Heaven is not a place we go to when we die. Jesus and the Bible tells us that heaven is even now breaking into our realm, our reality, earth. Heaven then is a new earth married with a new heaven, a new Jerusalem that descends from on high and a new reality that's more real and true than anything in our realm. And new bodies are given to each of us in Jesus Christ. Unbelievable, perhaps, but no less real. Amen? Now, Jesus also spoke a lot about hell. In his book, Heaven, Randy Alcorn says, Jesus talks about hell more than he talks about heaven and describes it more vividly. There's no denying that Jesus knew, believed, and warned against the absolute reality of hell. Here's what C.S. Lewis says about hell. He says, there is no doctrine which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this if it lay in my power. But it has the full support of Scripture and specifically of our Lord's own words. It has always been held by Christendom and has the support of reason. What is hell? Well, let's hear what Jesus says about it. In Matthew 25, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. Then the King will turn to those on, on the left and say, Away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons, and they will go away into eternal punishment. But the righteous will go into eternal life. How about Luke 12.5? Jesus warns, I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, He's the one to fear. Wow. Scripture tells us that hell is a place of conscious eternal torment where people who have rejected God experience His punishment for sin. Hell was originally created for the devil and his angels. Some people have told me I could never imagine a good God sending anyone to hell. And I love what Mark Moore says in his book. Really, I could never imagine a good God who wouldn't. And I know that may sound cruel at first, but think about who God is. Holy and pure a God who defines morality, what it means to be good and act ethically, so then shouldn't there be consequences for breaking those rules? Life here on earth has laws and consequences for immoral and unethical behavior, and we're nowhere even close to God's definition of justice here. But don't you take some comfort knowing that God's true, heavenly, eternal judgment will be brought about with every evil act in our reality throughout the ages. It will happen, friends. 
In his book, The Great Divorce, Lewis says, all that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is opened. Why would God surround himself eternally with those who reject him? Doesn't it make sense that those who choose to have nothing to do with God, that they'd go to a place where he isn't? I mean, unfortunately, artwork like Dante's Inferno and human imagination and, and film and media, we tend to think that those works are authoritative, but Scripture tells us that eternal damnation is realizing and, and even witnessing the joy of God's presence, but, but removed from afar, being in a place without Him, but knowing the reality of blessing with Him. And this is what Jesus describes as weeping and gnashing of teeth, the realization that we made the wrong choice and now there's nothing to do but, but weep and, and hiss in frustration. So if, if this was uncomfortable to talk about, get ready because Jesus also spoke about demons. <laughs> he spoke with demons. He cast them out in his very real ministry. Demons weren't rare in Jesus' ministry, they were common. And Scripture says that the devil and his demons are common even now. That when we claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, we should expect confrontation with the devil himself and interference from his demon. Scary stuff, but real. What are demons? Well, they're, they're fallen angels who follow the bidding of Satan in temptation and oppression, influence, and even infestation to lead people to destruction. I mean, that's really the devil's ultimate goal. The destruction of humanity and God's good creation, period. And I've talked about this before, but God created Satan. He actually created Satan. He was Lucifer before he slithered into the garden. And actually, Lucifer was good, if you can believe that. He had to be because in Genesis chapter 2, God declares everything he created, including Satan, Lucifer, as what? Good, not, but not just good, very good. So what happened? Well, Scripture give us, gives us clues and hints. Paul in 2 Corinthians says that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. Listen to Ezekiel 28, verse 12. You were the seal of perfection. This is God talking to Lucifer as he was cast out of heaven, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. And then when you skip down to verse 14, you were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. How about verses 16 to 17? Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. Crosswalk is a great website. And here's what Crosswalk says. The Bible tells us that demons are fallen angels who joined Satan in his rebellion against God but who were defeated and cast out of heaven. We can read that in Revelation chapter 12. Demons now continue to serve the devil in his attempt to lead the world away from God and into sin. Jesus will ultimately banish Satan and his demons into the eternal fire. And Jesus speaks of angels, God's heavenly warriors, the word for angel in the biblical Greek translates as messenger. So all throughout scripture, angels deliver God's messages. Angels also ministered to Jesus in Gethsemane and after his confrontation with Satan in the wilderness. Angels broke into this world when Christ was born. Try telling those shepherds that angels aren't real. They were terrified and the heavenly host had to tell them over and over not to be afraid. 
In Matthew 24, Jesus says, and he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Try telling missionary John Payton that angels aren't real. John Payton was a missionary in the New Hebrides Islands, now Vanuatu. One night, hostile natives surrounded the mission station, intent on burning out the Paytons and slaughtering them. Peyton and his wife, terrified, understandably, were on their knees and prayed during that ter- terror-filled night that God would deliver them. They prayed this prayer to God over and over and over. They could hear the soldiers, the native soldiers gathering around the the compound. But when daylight came, they were amazed to see that their attackers were nowhere to be found. So about a year later, the chief tribe, the chief of that tribe was finally led to Christ. And remembering what had happened, Peyton hesitantly asked the chief what had kept him from burning down that compound and, and killing them. I mean, after all, the chief and his native army had the camp surrounded. They could hear them. Well, the chief replied in surprise, well, who were all those men that with you there? Peyton knew no men were, with, were present with him and his wife, but the chief continued to describe that he and his soldiers were terrified to attack because they'd seen hundreds of these big, large men in shining garments with drawn swords encircling the mission compound. So they ran in terror. Try telling the chief and his soldiers that angels aren't real. Why didn't they attack if they aren't real? So what does this mean for us now? I mean, we could spend 52 weeks just talking about the supernatural, right? That might be a good study for us to do sometime. But what does this mean now for us? I would say a lot. And I pray you agree, knowing and believing that there is this constant heavenly battle in a very real unseen realm around us should humble us and and cause us to then ask, what do I do now? Not casually or dismissively. This is asked with the intent of wisdom and action, knowing and understanding that reality and then doing something about it. You know, like that explorer going to Australia or New Zealand. That new world is very much real. So what do I need to pack then? What what do I need to learn? What do I need to let go of? What do I need to embrace in order to live in that new world? Uh, Likewise, knowing that the supernatural is, is real and all around us, how do we protect ourselves? That's important. Prayer, first and foremost, right? Join us Tuesday nights here, weekly prayer. I mean, prayer is really the air we breathe. That's how natural it should be. Reflexive to a point where we don't even think about it, we just do it. So practice doing it Tuesday nights on Tuesday prayer. Belief in Jesus and calling on his name when we sense demonic and satanic influence. Jesus is the light that scatters the darkness. You know, Micheline and I spent the first early years of our marriage in New York City. Try walking into an apartment, any apartment in New York City, turn on the light, and what's the first thing you see? (laughs) Cockroaches scatter. (laughs) I don't miss that. But Jesus is the light that scatters the darkness. Amen? At the name of Jesus, every knee, every knee, even the demons and Satan, will bow. And actually, the devil and his armies have to flee. They don't even think about it. They can't stand the light. They flee. They have to. They have no choice because Jesus conquered all evil. Amen? So until Christ returns, evil like a trapped rodent knows its time is short and it's putting up a fight with its final breath. But Jesus' name and the spoken and proclaimed word of God defeat the darkness now. Period. So learn it. Know it. Believe it. Pray it. 
speak it and the darkness flees. If you need help, talk to us. Talk to each other. In Ephesians 6, Paul tells us that we have God's armor given by Him to protect us. That's pretty good armor if God is giving it to us, yes? So put it on every day. Put it on throughout the day if you need to. I do. Remind yourself. Remind each other to wear this armor because it's real and it works. On our website, we have an Armor of God prayer card that you can print out and keep in your purse or in your pocket. Print it, pray it, and do it. Why is our faith so important? Because this heavenly battle all around us, is for, it comes down to our loyalty, to good or to evil. That's it. God wants our believing loyalty. That's literally the definition of biblical faith, our believing loyalty, which isn't just in our minds, it's in our hearts, and it's in the way we act and move in this world, our believing loyalty, our faith, and that's our choice, friends, because we're learning, right, that God created us to dwell with us. Satan had another plan, and unfortunately, we opened the door to him, thus the curse of the fallen world Famine, natural disasters, abuse, murder, injustice, war, death. But the good news, there's always good news, yes? This did not thwart God's plan of dwelling with His created family. Through Jesus' atoning work on the cross, God provided the way and the truth of life with Him in Jesus, guaranteed by His Holy Spirit, yes, by choosing sin, we divorced ourselves from God, but through Jesus Christ, we are adopted back into God's eternal heavenly family. And now we are welcomed back as His children with an eternal inheritance more real and true than life itself. Amen? What's the point? Well, God doesn't want anyone to live without with this reality. That's what Scripture says. God doesn't want anyone to live without this reality. Shouldn't that be our, de our desire then as well? That none would perish? That all would be adopted and welcomed into God's eternal family forever and ever? Because if that's not true, then what really is? If you have questions, please talk to us. God bless you all. Amen. As we come to communion, let's prepare our hearts. We're going to sing a song, but as we come to communion, knowing this reality of the supernatural, this is a supernatural meal we're about to share. There's weight to it. It's real. Let's prepare ourselves. Would you stand as we sing My Savior's Love?
be seated. On the night our Savior was betrayed and arrested, he prepared a meal and shared it with his disciples. And there was bread and there was a cup of wine. He lifted the bread and God blessed it. And then he broke it and distributed it to his disciples. And as they tasted it, he said, take and eat this. This bread represents my body, which is broken and given for you. As you eat this, remember me. Let's eat. And in the same way, he lifted the cup. God blessed it and distributed it to his disciples. They each got a drink, even the one who betrayed him. And he said, as you drink this, remember me. This cup holds what represents as my blood, which is shed and spilt, but in a new covenant of forgiveness of sin, not just for a few, but for everyone. As you drink this, remember me. Let's drink. Before we sing our final song, we're going to give a word of thanks to God for the gifts that he's given us and as we give back a portion of that in our tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, you have given us more than we deserve sometimes, but we thank you that you have gone to prepare a place for us. And Lord, at this time in our service, we think of our gifts and we just give back a small portion of what you have blessed with us blessed us with and we just pray that you would use it mightily in your kingdom on here on earth in Jesus name we pray amen our closing song is a, a prayer song this morning um, be thou my vision we just ask that you would stand with, with us as we sing be thou my vision
first time visitor, uh, we have a gift for you at the visitor table in the lobby. Stop by and we'll get you fixed up with a hand painted mug. I'm reading from Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. May you go in the victory of Jesus this week in our spiritual battles. Have a great week.